TikTok, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over the world. I am your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood, and with me right now is the Prince. <laughs> I think I called I think I called you the prince. I think I called you the prince the first time I ever uh, I ever met you. I said the, the prince. I, I, I forgot about that, but now it, you remind me. That's hilarious. Now, uh, uh, but before we get into this, the question on everyone's mind, uh, Sean, is how in the world did someone like you get interested in apologetics? Right? I mean, who would have thought that such a thing would happen given my background? Most people say I'm the least likely apologist, and it's just one of those stories you never would have seen coming. So, fair question. <laughs> uh, yeah, and um, uh, so I, I just wanted to I just wanted to say before we go into our topic. So obviously we're going to be talking about um, uh, the deaths of the apostles and so on. And this is uh, Sean is one of the experts on this issue, but just wanted to give props to your dad. Uh, the book, More Than a Carpenter, was the first apologetics book, was the first Christian apologetics book I ever read where I knew I was reading Christian apologetics. Uh, because cool. I, I had read, like I'd read uh, uh, Hugh Ross's book, um, what is it, Creator in the Cosmos. I'd, I'd read that. Yep. I'd read some other books, but I just thought I was reading about Christianity. I didn't know what apologetics was. And then, mm. so by the way, this was, all, this was all in prison. So I was there in prison and uh, I was already a Christian, and an, a, an old guy who'd been locked up for like 40 years or something came up to me and he said, my granddaughter sent me this. I ain't going to read it. Looks like something you'd be interested in. He hands it to me, and it was, wow. it was, it was more than a carpenter, right? And I'm like, what is this? Wow. But I, I remembered seeing it in the Christian Book Distributors catalog, which, which we got over and over again. Um, but it was, under, uh, it was under Christian apologetics. And I was like, what the heck is Christian apologetics and stuff? So I read the book, and I was reading the book, and I was going, oh, wait a minute. This is what I like. This is what I'm interested in. Hey, I want to do this. So that was actually, uh, that mm -hmm. was actually when I realized that I wanted to do Christian apologetics, was reading uh, more than a carpenter. And as you know, of course, one of the main arguments in More Than a Carpenter uh, has to do with the deaths of the apostles. So why don't you go ahead and give us, before we get into like modern research, which we'll be going through, why don't you tell us sort of the, the old school picture that, you know, people like me back in the day would have, would have been familiar with? Well, first off, that's pretty awesome to hear. I'm not sure I had heard your story and how influential More Than a Carpenter was, so I will relay that to my dad, but that's that's pretty humbling and neat to hear. He is 80 now and been doing this for a long time, and so the reach and impact God has used him for is is pretty awesome. So I just I heard this argument growing up. Obviously, it's in my dad's book. He would speak on it, present on it. It made sense to me. I thought, mm -hmm. gosh, why would these guys put themselves in harm's way and die if this wasn't true? Uh, I didn't really have questions and doubts about my faith at all. In fact, to be honest with you, if you had asked me in high school, I might not have worded it this way, but in the back of my mind, I might have thought, if someone's not a Christian, they just hadn't read more than a carpenter. Like, how hard is it? Mm -hmm. There's the evidence. And of course, you grow up and realize, wow, there's really smart people that see the world differently. Uh, but it wasn't really until probably about 2010. So in 2009, I actually helped my dad update the book More Than a Carpenter. And we included a section on the death of the apostles, but I had not studied it formally. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it says this might be the biggest footnote in the history of the world in the sense that it says, for the death of the apostles, see church history. That's exactly what it says. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't looked at that or thought of it in years. And looking back, it's almost embarrassing. Like, I can't believe I footnoted that. So it was the year after that I started my PhD program. And that's one of the things that probed me. I'm like, what is the church history? But at the time, I just didn't have the folks and ability to look into it. When my dissertation came along, I'm like, this is a perfect topic. Mm -hmm. I really want to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, so in, in case everyone's wondering about the significance of, of what we're, we're, we're talking right now, talking about right now, um, the main reason I took Christ I started taking Christianity seriously, and my main reason for ultimately converting was, you know, when I was young, I thought I had an explanation for the rise of Christianity. I thought, you know, a bunch of guys, they had the guy that they believed was their Messiah, and he died, and they decided they wanted to keep the movement going on, and so they invented this story about the resurrection. Well, their problem solved, right? 
Um, the problem was when I, I was locked up, so this is when I was in jail, uh, I found out from a Christian who also gave me a copy of like Fox's book of martyrs and so on, how the apostles went to these horrible bloody deaths. And that started bothering me because it didn't fit with my story, right? It didn't fit with what I believe. These guys made up a story. I was thinking if they really made it up, are all of these guys going to be ready to go to these horrible bloody deaths over this stuff that they knew that they made up? And a, a lot of, uh, a lot of atheists have a problem uh, with, with, with this issue on, in the sense that they don't see how significant it is. They'll say, uh, well, you know, jihadis, they die for what they believe. It doesn't, make, it doesn't, mean, uh, doesn't mean it's true. But I saw immediately, no, there's, there's something different about this. These guys are dying for something that they claim to, to have seen. And so I, I, was, I just sat there and thinking, what, how many people can I think of in history who died for something that they knew they made up? And couldn't think of anyone. And then it was, it became, well, what are the odds that Jesus just happened to have all of them? Like all of the people who are willing to die for a lie. Uh, all of the people, I mean, uh, you know, something, all of the people who in history who died for something they knew they made up, it just happened to be this guy's, this guy's followers. And so mm. rustling through that, I just came to think, what, what could have convinced all of them that they saw a man ri risen from the dead? Uh I couldn't think of anything other than him actually rising mm. from the dead, and so that was that made me that made me start uh, start taking Christianity uh, more seriously, and then and then ultimately converting. But but you know then later on then later on I find out well maybe some of the stories in Fox's Book of Martyrs aren't actually can't can't actually be trusted. Maybe we don't have great historical evidence for some of these deaths. But that's where you come in because you've uh, you've you've uh, You've been through all this, so we could start how we could start however you want. If you wanted to say anything more about the uh, significance of the evidence or something like that, or we can we can just kind of jump right into going through the deaths of the apostles. But I just wanted everyone to understand yeah, why yeah. why this is important. This Christianity is founded on this, right? Jesus died. We all know that, and then his followers go around and they're proclaiming that he rose from the dead, and. And they're willing to lay down their lives for what they claim to have seen. That's kind of the main evidence for Christianity. And so, if we 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 kind of need to know what they were actually uh, what that they were actually willing to die for this stuff. Yeah, that's well said. Let me let me frame the argument in a way that might be helpful. Because when I jumped into my research, I had a conversation with a pastor. He goes, "Man, you're going to make a liar out of all of us." And I said, "My goal is not to make a liar out of anybody. I've heard this argument." And I want to know if it's any good. Mm -hmm. Do we have reason to think Christianity is true, the resurrection happened? Do the deaths of the apostles help this in any way? If so, what's the most accurate and powerful way to formulate it? And I think it's this. Sometimes people will say the apostles were burned, stabbed, skinned, crucified. They wouldn't die for a lie, therefore Christianity is true. Well, that is a very simplistic, arguably inaccurate way to put it. I argue in the book very carefully that even if all the apostles died as martyrs for their belief in the resurrection, that doesn't prove the resurrection is true. And it certainly doesn't prove Christianity is true. What it shows is they really believe that Jesus had appeared to them. It shows that they're not liars, that they're not making up this story to have themselves put in harm's way. So in a sense, you could say the willingness of the apostles to suffer and die in fact, is a part of a larger resurrection argument that people like Habermas and Lacona, William Lane Craig, and T. Wright, et cetera, have laid out. So it's an important piece, but only one piece of a larger argument. Now, I had a conversation actually on the trip, um, the trip before we took to Israel, David, coming to think of it, William Lane Craig was on that trip, and he had made a statement that we don't have to show that any of them actually died as martyrs, just that they're willing to suffer and die shows their sincerity. And technically, they're right. I mean, who am I to differ with Dr. Craig? Mm -hmm. But I, we had a conversation. I said, I think you're right, but I've done some research on this. And I think if we can show that not only they're all willing to, but in fact, we at least have good reason to believe that some of them died as martyrs, and there's no good reason to think that any of them recanted, I think it just strengthens the case for their sincerity. So that's it. Their willingness to die doesn't show that hallucinations are false. We can address that on different grounds. It essentially shows they're not making this up. They're not liars, not a big conspiracy. They at least were willing to go to their graves thinking that Jesus had appeared to them.
that's the heart of the argument that I'm trying to advance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I would uh, I would agree with you completely. I mean, you, you can find you can find all kinds of people who seem like they're willing to die, but uh, when they actually are willing to, you know, you they actually lay down their lives for what they believe. That's when you know, okay, this person unquestionably uh, believes what he's dying for here. Uh, one quick one quick question here before we go on. Uh, Expanding Truth says, on a scale of one to ten, how badly do I have to read evidence that demands a verdict? Uh, Eleven. I mean, come on, you're asking somebody who was a co-author <laughs> with an update. What am I going to say? That's a softball. Now, to be honest with you, look, it depends on what you're looking for, your level of research and awareness of this. I don't know who you are. Uh, so I'm speaking somewhat facetiously, but I would say my dad wrote that book. It sold some millions of copies. And one of the updates that we did in 2017 together was to include a chap- chapter on the deaths of the apostles. And in its category, it did win an award for a book of the year, which frankly just felt good for me to honor my dad in that way. So it's gotten really good feedback. If you're looking for a book, that's going to give you introductory material that cites all the experts in one volume on the resurrection, deity, Christ, and scriptures, then that would be a book for you. But it really just depends on what you're looking for and what you want out of it. Mm-hmm. All right. And so now we uh, we kind of understand... We kind of understand the significance of the point um, that if the apostles are willing to lay down their lives, this shows that they really believed what they were dying for and what they were proclaiming is that Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to them. And so they must have really believed that. What's what's really interesting here is um, <clears throat> this isn't this isn't simply a, a Christian position. You can go to people like uh, like Bart Ehrman and Gerd Ludemann and all of these people who don't believe the resurrection actually happened, but they would say, yep, yeah, but the, the disciples actually really believe this stuff. They'll acknowledge that these guys really believed it. So even Even a lot of critics who reject the supernatural, don't believe in God, don't believe in Christianity, uh, have still been persuaded by the kind of evidence that you're going to be talking about. They really believe that they know what the disciples believed because of their willingness to go out and die for it. Mm. Now, Ehrman, in his debate with Craig, Craig raised the willingness of the apostles to die. And Ehrman pushed back and said, I've read all the sources in 300 years and none of them actually demonstrate this. That's not word for word what he said, but essentially he pushed back on Craig and said there's no good evidence for this. So Ehrman doesn't accept as far as I understand. Why in the the world does he say it's a a fact of history that that the disciples believe that Jesus appeared to them? Um, I don't know the basis of that for Ehrman. It might be some of the early documents like 1 Corinthians 15 and the consistent Mm -hmm. testimony Mm -hmm. that he trusts would be my guess. I, I'm not sure about that, but I do know that he pushes back on the deaths of the apostles and has written some responses to this, in fact. But I do find, I mean, if we jump into some of the evidence, there's actually some of these sources where Ehrman, I found quotes in lesser known books of his, where he says, for example, in Clement of Rome, which is written in the mid to the end of the 90s, l- written in Rome, by the way, so he talks, you find the deaths in First Clement 4 and in First Clement 5, a reference to the deaths of Peter and Paul, who the tradition says was in Rome. Mm-hmm. So Clement would have been in a unique position, I think, to assess mm-hmm. this tradition. And Ehrman says in the Loeb classical series where he edits First Clement and Second Clement, he says Clement is aware of a tradition of the death of both Peter and Paul. So Ehrman does cite it in that book. And he also references Polycarp, who refers to this is now you're moving into the middle of the second century, uh, a tradition of the death of uh, Paul. Ehrman says this is a tradition that was early and known of the death of Paul. So he doesn't as a whole accept it. But as I've tracked down some different sources of him, I found him supporting a few individual documents of early traditions of the death of at least Peter and Paul that I thought was was pretty interesting. Uh, I think Ehrman tends to become a bit more skeptical when something is going to be used against him. Like uh, like he used to grant the empty tomb until Craig was until Craig was using it in a debate and then it's hey, nope, I, I don't I don't I don't I don't believe the empty tomb. Uh, 
Uh, and 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 uh, in, in his debate with Dan Wallace, Dan Wallace even stood up and said, "Which which which ermine are we going to be debating tonight? Uh, is it going to be the one who writes for scholarly journals and acknowledges that we have the best established book, you know, the best attested book in history, or is it going to be the one who writes these popular books and then suddenly uh, mm. changes his position?" Anyway, um, uh, there was there there was, uh, but before we jump and and uh, you could just tell me who you who you'd like to uh, address first, but uh, I wanted to make sure. I thought we were clear on this, but uh, have to be clear on this. Ike Elder said, can we say the same thing for Muslims that blow themselves up? Um, as far as their willingness yeah. to die, showing that they really believe what they're dying for, I would say, yeah. Is, it, is, that, is that what you think? Well, I wouldn't use the term martyr for mm -hmm. a Muslim or anybody who blows themselves up. Mm -hmm. I think that's an act of homicide martyrdom we're talking about is somebody allowing somebody to take their life or putting themselves in a position to be harmed and lose their life tied to what they believe. So I would not use that for Muslim martyrs. Second, when you look at, say, 9-11, this is the first objection that comes up. People say, well, if I'm not mistaken, there were 15 uh, Muslim radicals willing to lay down their life for what they believed. And I'd say, look, their willingness to suffer and die is no different than you and I, David. If somebody comes up to us and asks us, do we believe it? And we take one for the team and die, people would walk away and go, wow, that David, that guy, he believed it. Sean really believed it. Mm -hmm. But that's no proof for Christianity. Mm -hmm. But the apostles yep. lived and traveled with Jesus three years. And they put themselves in a position of harm's way based on what they saw with their own eyes not what they said they receive, second, third, fourth, sixth, seventh hand, etc. So they are the pillars, so to speak, who began this movement. So their testimony and their sincerity is much more significant than your sincerity, my mm -hmm. sincerity, or any Muslim, to use this quote, who blew himself up. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's Sean McDowell imposing his Christian view of martyrdom on Islam, which has a different view. Of, uh, of of martyrdom. Um, uh, so so Ike Elder, we hope we hope you're getting this. I, I would just to give an example, Ike Elder, of, of what what we're talking about here. If a bunch of people say, you know, I really believe in aliens, and you say, why do you believe in aliens? They're like, I don't know. You know, you just look around at the universe, and there's got to be there's got to be aliens out there, right? And then someone says, no, you don't really believe in aliens. I'll start killing you, and he starts he starts killing them. And then there are all these people who say they're willing, they believe in aliens are all willing to die and they all suffer death. Well, that doesn't tell me that aliens is, exist. That tells me that they really, really believe that aliens exist. So that's, that's one scenario. People who just say they believe in aliens and they're willing to die for it. That tells me that they really believe in aliens doesn't tell me that aliens actually exist. However, imagine... A dozen people come up to me and they say, we just got abducted by aliens. We were sucked up into their ship and, you know, they probed us and did all kinds of things to us. And then they put us back down there. And suppose someone says to them, well, I don't th I think you're making this up and I'm going to I'm, I'm going to kill you. Now, suppose all of those people are willing to die for what they believe, for what they they claim they experienced and saw with their own eyes. That's in a different category. Now, now I would have to I would have to conclude they really believe what they're saying about what they what they saw they really believe that so what's the best explanation here is there an alternative is there a better alternative than thinking that they were actually sucked up into an, an alien ship and that they got probed mm. uh could this you know could this be a you know a hallucination or something like that I'd have to you have to go down the list but those are different kinds of categories one would just tell me a lot about what you believe the other would mean that i have something to explain i have to explain what these people saw in order to give them this kind of confidence. So that's what we're talking about uh, with the apostles. So uh, who do you want to start with? I'm guessing one of the big ones, Peter, Paul, James, someone. Yeah, sure. Let's let's start with Peter. That makes sense. All right. So um, the, the, apost the apostle Peter, do we have good reasons to think that he was willing to die for his claims about Jesus? So when it comes to Peter, uh, the, actually the way I look at the apostles is something called the living memory. This comes from a, a scholar on Peter named Marcus Bachmule. And he says there's a certain value in sources that are within three generations where there's still a living memory passed on and it's not just purely history. It takes us up to the end of the second century roughly. Doesn't mean stuff afterwards is false, doesn't mean stuff earlier is true, but that's the methodology that I used. So when it comes to Peter, 
within the first and the second century, we have 10 sources of greater and lesser strength that unanimously agree that Peter died as a martyr. There's no alternate tradition I could find anywhere within centuries in the church that anything else happened to Peter. So the two sources in the first century would be, of course, John 21, where Jesus says to Peter, you will be taken where you do not want to go, and you will be clothed by somebody else. And then in parentheses in the English translation, an indication of how he was going to die. Now, clearly, it doesn't say crucifixion there, interestingly enough, but that doesn't matter for my argument how he died. It's just that he was taken somewhere against his desires and put to death. And by the way, that's in a context in John 21 of where Jesus is saying, now you're the shepherd of the sheep, and like me, you denied me before, now you're going to lay down your life. And by the way, Ehrman says that this is a tradition towards the end of the first century of a death of Peter as a martyr. He uses that word. Second document in the first century would be Clement of Rome. Now a letter written by Clement in Rome. And if you read First Clement, really chapters four and five, it's about how um, kind of jealousy leads to division and ultimately death. And Clement gives some ancient examples, and then he moves to Peter and Paul and references them, I think, in very clear terms that they would die as a martyr, not using that word, but making that term. Again, Ehrman says, Clement is aware of a tradition of the death of Peter and Paul at the end of the first century. So you have two sources in the 90s, so there still would be people alive who would have known Peter, not tens of thousands, but there still would have been eyewitnesses around who could confirm or deny this. We're talking the generation after the apostles themselves. And then as you move into the second century, from writers like Ignatius uh, into the middle and towards the end kind of with Tertullian, you have this consistent story that Peter died as a martyr and no contradictory account. So I actually think, not to mention later writers like Eusebius affirm this, but now you're into the fourth century. I think the consistent story is we are on solid ground that Peter dies as a martyr. And this is one that even, I recently had a YouTube debate with a fellow named Apologia. You might recognize him. And we debated the apostles back and forth. And even he conceded that Peter and Paul died as a martyr. Okay. So that one, I think we're on about as solid ground as you could be historically for something that happened 2,000 years ago. So this one has the, the skeptic's approval. Yeah, at least that skeptic's yeah. approval. There are some scholars who debate it and tweak it. And of course, the question comes up, was Peter crucified upside down? And the really interesting thing about this, David, is the first reference to Peter being crucified upside down is in a book called The Acts of Peter, which is an apocryphal account that has these clearly legend-filled, miraculous elements added on top of it, dated to the end of the second century, probably, 81, probably 180, 190. And what's interesting about it, though, is if you read it in context, the point is Peter is upside down, and when he's upside down, he can see the world as it actually is, and his death will help right the world in the way that Jesus did. So he's put upside down, not for a historical point, but for a theological point, and later church leaders pick up on that. So as best I can assess, it's possible he was crucified upside down, because there is some record of that, like in Hengel's book on crucifixion. But I don't think it's at least probable. I actually think what's interesting is one thing we know about crucifixion is somebody was stripped bare. But in John 21, it says you'll be clothed by another. I've actually come to think since writing my dissertation that he probably wasn't crucified and was probably killed in other fashion. But for our factor here, it doesn't matter, upside down, crucified, another fashion. We have multiple early sources saying that Peter died as a martyr, and I don't think any good reason not to accept that account. So we can, uh, we can draw a distinction between knowing uh, that someone, having good reason to believe that someone uh, died as a martyr, but still be skeptical and critical of details that appear, especially in, in later stories down the road. Yeah, this is actually a really interesting part of the research that I did. As you get into the second, third, fourth centuries, you have this hagiography where people are telling these stories of the apostles, and they're filled with legends. 
but there's also a historical core to them. And it's not really till the fourth and fifth century that they become completely unhinged from mm-hmm. history. So part of the challenge is to take like the Acts of Peter and say, you know what, it's full of like, you know, in the Acts of Paul, I think he baptizes a lion. In the Acts of John, there's all these bed bugs that John commands around. Like there's funny stories, but they're actually surrounding a historical core. Mm-hmm. So how do we pull out what's historical from what's legendary? That was some of the challenge of my research. But when it comes to Peter, we have so many consistent early sources that we can stand, I think, on solid ground that he really died as a martyr. And by the way, in my research, I came up with a historical grid from least probable to most probable. And based on the quantity and quality of research, I try to assess each apostle. Number one, did they go on missionary work? Number two, did they die as a martyr? Number three, how did they die? And just, you know, there's some subjective element, but I try to lay out my criteria. So you're right. How he died, I think we have less confidence than that Peter actually died as a martyr. Mm-hmm. So uh, Peter Peter definitely gets a check on, on the best evidence we have tells us that he was martyred. We have uh, early sources of people who were in a good position to know. And then mm-hmm. the, you, you have one consistent story wherever you go inconsistent they could be inconsistent on the details but uh, they're they're unanimous on his willingness to die and his and his martyrdom that's right and by the way these sources aren't doing historical accounts asking the question that you and I are asking mm-hmm. these are documents written for other purposes but they include statements that we can decipher in context and piece some of this together so mm-hmm. i think peter's on saw ground now by the way to give context i took the 12 apostles and I took James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul. So I took those 14. Of the 12 apostles, I think Peter is on the highest level historically or close to it. Of the 12 apostles, the only one I would put on that level additionally, or actually maybe close to it, not quite that level, would be James, the son of Zebedee. Now, James, the son of Zebedee, the earliest account we have is in Acts chapter 12. And what's interesting about Acts chapter 12, it describes Herod takes him and beheads him, and then the passage moves on and Peter flees. Now, for reasons we won't get into here, I believe Acts is a reliable historical account, and we can trust it as an early good source. But if you compare James with the death of Stephen, that's in earlier chapters in Acts. Now, I do think Stephen chapter is, is accurate. But I was having another conversation with Skeptic recently, and they said it clearly feels like the Stephen story is doctored to sound like the story of Jesus. I said, I have some pushback and challenges to that, but fine. So if you're going to push back on Stephen and say, because it reads that way, we don't accept it, then you have to concede that James, which doesn't read that way, and as Keener says in his four-volume commentary, it just reads like a straightforward execution account therefore is a good, reliable historical account. And then all the sources after James confirm that as well. So bottom line of the 12, I think Peter is the highest. I might put James like a notch below that, but still good historical evidence. He died as a martyr. Those are the two of the 12 I would put in that higher category. So the uh, so these are kind of uh, different ways of, of looking at things with with when you're looking at historical, you know, stories or something like that, you know, one of the big questions that would come up is, uh, is there is there a good reason to invent this story? Uh, why would someone in, invent this story? And it doesn't mean that someone did invent the story, but if you can think, oh, here's why someone might have invented this story. So when you're when you're reading the martyrdom of Stephen, can you think, you know, can you think of is there a reason someone might have wanted to embellish this or do that? You can come up with reasons. Doesn't doesn't mean they did. But yeah, with, yeah, with the with the death of James, that they're not trying to draw any tremendous meaning out of it. There are no you know there's no amazing uh, amazing uh, supernatural events attached to it. It's just uh, like it's almost mentioned in past. Oh, by the way, they killed him. Uh, and then and then the story yeah. moves on. And so there's no they're not trying to make any any tremendous point there. And if they were you know if 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 Luke were trying to invent a story about someone being killed, seems, I mean, it just doesn't seem to be any reason for it right there. And so here, it seems like the only reason that's there is just because he's, he's announcing when, when James was killed. So I, I do think in Acts, it helps advance the story of the persecution and why Peter flees. Mm -hmm. 
so it fits the larger story. But I think the point you're making is right, that there's not these flowery details to try to make it seem like, you know, he looks up into the heavens and he died the way that Jesus did, the way you might expect one of the top three of the 12 to die. Rather, it's just stated without any additional details. So the book of Acts can move along towards the advance from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the kind of death that's given to James we know was the kind of death that was used. John the Baptist was beheaded. Paul was probably beheaded. That was a common means of execution. So you just start looking at these particulars and the reliability of Acts, and then you look outside of the book of Acts and the other documents that we have, and you just see this consistent story and no competing claims about the way that James died. So I think we're on good historical grounds, even if you don't think the Bible's inspired good historical grounds to conclude that James, in fact, was executed in a way that was tied to his faith and the proclamation thereof. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, A couple of side notes here. I see some people uh, sharing sharing links to your materials and so on. I did put a link to uh, to your website and your YouTube channel and to your cool. book your book on this topic. Those are in the description box for anyone who wants links to Sean's uh, website, his YouTube channel, which you should, you should uh, subscribe to, and to his book if you if you want the the full case. Uh, and one, one hey, lo- by, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, the book is an academic book. I apologize. I had no power over that. I think paperback is $50. If anybody is like, I want to buy that, email me through my site. And I have a link I can't post publicly, but I can send you a discount code for about 35% off. So if you want that, that's the discount I can get on it. Email me through seanmcdowell.org and I'll personally send you the link. Yes, I saw some people complaining about how expensive it is, but that that's guys <laughs> guys, that's how that's how academic books are, right? They uh you yeah. you, you basically uh, you know, if you make a if you make a popular level book and you know millions of people read it, then you don't need to make much. You know, the the, the publisher doesn't need to, to charge much because they're going to make a you know a little bit of money on all these books. If you uh, scholarly books, then they they're typically much bigger and they uh, they they're not made for a popular audience. So it's more people who are really interested in that topic who get them. So they just uh, they charge more. But you got a uh, you got a good deal here. Offer. Oh, little side note for clarification here. Uh, Jeremy Wong asked, uh, is it uh, when you're talking about the debate earlier, I said, is it Apologia Church, Jeff Durbin? No, there's, there would be no reason for Sean to be debating Apologia. I think you said Apologia. I think the the atheist that I'm aware of is named Apologia because me and. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Me and, and Sp- Apologia, not Apologia. Yeah. Pa- so Apologia, okay. I think his name is Paul with an Ogia o- o- on the end because uh, yeah. uh, Inspiring Philosophy and I went through one of his videos on. Uh, I think he was attacking the moral argument or something like that. And we went through and, and, uh, and yeah. discussed that on a live stream. All right. So that's all, that's all been clarified. All right. So Peter gets a check. James gets a check. You said, uh, James, really good evidence, maybe a touch below what you have for Peter. So is this, is this how you're proceeding sort of in order of, uh, uh, of evidence? Not necessarily. Okay. I was starting with the 12 and then moving to James oh, okay. and that Paul makes sense. Out, outside. That makes sense. So, let, but let's shift to James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul, and then go back to the other disciples, mm-hmm. what evidence there is. So, in other words, we're looking at the top four. So, if we take the 12 disciples and we take James, brother of Jesus, and Paul, that's 14. I think four of them were on high historical grounds to conclude they died as martyrs. So, James, now the brother of Jesus, not one of the 12. Uh, we know that he had an appearance of Jesus. First Corinthians 15 mentions the appearance to James. And you can also ascertain this, I think, from looking at the book of Acts, at least the appearance to the 12 and his position in the church. Uh, James, the death, what's very interesting is here's where you have a non-Christian source in Josephus. And Josephus, there's two references to Jesus, of course. One, the Testimonium Flavianum that is debated where he references the death of Jesus, what the what was proclaimed about him, uh, resurrection, being the Messiah. But there's another passage in Antiquities where it refers to the death of James incidentally. And he's just mentioned as the brother of Jesus. It's this incidental side reference in a larger political argument. And most scholars, at least that I could read and find, accept this because it's not the kind of thing that anybody would invent 
and put on the lips of Josephus. It wouldn't have helped them in any regard until like now when we're asking these questions. So most accept that, and it's a reference to the death of James, probably written in the mid to early 90s by Josephus. Then you skip to the second century. What you also have for James is then you have Gnostic sources, and then you also have Christian sources. And these are all within the first and second century. So the Christian sources uh, recorded in uh, in Eusebius that takes that date to the middle of the second century, and then what's called the Apocalypse of James. So what's unique about James' bottom line is you have a Jewish source, Christian source, and Gnostic sources that all agree on his death early. Now they differ over some of the particulars, so we're back to the question how much legend is added, etc. But the agreement as a whole I think is very, very strong that James in fact died as a martyr. Now I'll tell you, David, one pushback that uh, that uh, Apologia got into with me, here's a difference, is he said, we don't know that James died for his belief in the resurrection. Mm -hmm. He died, if you read Josephus, really for political means. And my pushback to that is there's not this fine line in the first century between religious beliefs and political beliefs. Jesus was put to death for both. Mm -hmm. There was a political dimension and there was a religious dimension. So here's James in the very city that Jesus had been crucified three decades earlier, leading this church movement with full awareness of what happened to his leader. And we know that when a leader was executed, it was not uncommon in the Roman Empire to execute other key leaders that promote the same movement. James is proclaiming this message of following this crucified Messiah with full awareness of what it could cost him. So if he died of a heart attack or someone broke into his house and robbed him and he died, I fully can see that has nothing to do with martyrdom. Mm. But he's put himself in harm way. He's proclaiming this public message is killed for political and faith reasons. I think he qualifies as a martyr. But nonetheless, even if we don't use the word martyr, it doesn't really matter. Because James is putting himself in harm's way by proclaiming this message, which minimally shows his sincerity that he had believed, the he had seen the risen Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially if we are, uh, if we accept the arguments that James was a was an unbeliever during Jesus' life and rejected him, and maybe even thought he was he was his brother was crazy. Uh, that he then goes out and is is willing, you know, he 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 buys into the idea that Jesus is the Messiah, and so even if it's you know kind of a, even if it's a political issue for him, it's he's willing to die for whatever it was that he encountered that gave him this massive massive change in life. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's right, and. You know, in some ways, I had to spend a lot of time studying the definition of martyrdom, and I didn't realize there's a ton of literature in this. And uh, some people argue that if you don't have a moment of showing that you recanted, or you had the opportunity to recant mm -hmm. and choose not to, then you don't qualify as a martyr. Now, we don't have that for the apostles. Mm -hmm. We don't have an early record where somebody says, Peter, would you recant? Paul, would you recant? We'll let you live. But I don't think that's a necessary condition for martyrdom. In fact, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in 2016, there was a French priest who was in serving communion, and three radical Muslims walked in, in and slit his throat in the middle of this. Now, his last words, I think he said something like, get away from me, Satan, but he was not given an opportunity to recant. But you know what's interesting is the president of France and the media and Christians and one Muslim that I read all referred to him as a martyr. I thought that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. So I think we're on good ground to refer to them as martyrs, but even if we don't, it really wouldn't undermine the heart of the case of their sincerity about Jesus and at least willingness to suffer and die for this belief. Yeah. Uh, so, I, guys, the, the idea here is if you, you know, you take a Christian, you're, he's walking out of church and someone walks up behind him and kills him. Uh, do you call him a do you call him a martyr? Well, you know, you, you, 
it doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like you would. But, you know, with, with someone like, with a group like the Apostles, clearly if they're experiencing persecution over the years, and especially after people start getting killed, you, you could you could see even if you don't have a good historical record of them right before death and them being given the opportunity, hey, you want to change your story now? Well, you know, they had 20, 30, 40 years to change their story given given the things that were, were going on. And so, yeah, kind of kind of seems like they, they'd fit the category of martyr there. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, really some of the key passages in this is if you look at Acts 4 and 5, is the apostles led by Peter go out and start proclaiming the risen Jesus. I mean, I read through the book of Acts, you have the Kyrgma, the first teaching, and it's amazing how at Pentecost and sermon after sermon, the heart of the message they're giving is that Jesus has risen from the grave. And they're threatened and they're beaten and they're thrown in prison mm -hmm. and told, if you just stop preaching this, we'll leave you alone. And Peter says, we can't. We fear God more than we fear men. In other words, we believe this Christian story, which is rooted in the resurrection, and we will preach it even if you persecute and harm us for preaching this. We won't stop. Mm -hmm. That's the heart of the argument. I think they really believe this and weren't making it up and intentionally put themselves in harm's way. Mm -hmm. um, so we have Peter and two Jameses that would get the thumbs up on dying for their belief in Jesus and being being martyrs. Um, were you done with James? Uh, done with James. The other one I would put in that high category would be Paul. Mm -hmm. And again, Paul is not one of the 12, but of course wrote a ton of the New Testament. And Paul claims to have an appearance of Jesus. This mm -hmm. is in 1 Corinthians 15, three times in the book of Acts. And so I think he warranted being in this group. Well, when you look at Paul, with Peter, we had 10 sources. With Paul, off the top of my head, I think it was eight. Two, possibly three in the first century, and then five to six in the second century. So the first century would be like the book of Acts. There's a good case that could be made that Pete, uh, Paul's life is mirroring after Jesus' life. And even though it doesn't include his crucifixion, we're meant to believe that his life is going to end the same way that Jesus did. That's one line of evidence. I don't think that's super strong, but an argument can be made there. The second one that's not as strong is interestingly enough in 2 Timothy, where Timothy writes, he says, I'm about to be poured out like a libation. I fought the good, I've ran the race, I fought the faith. Well, what's interesting is you and I believe Timothy wrote this. Uh, a lot of critical scholars don't. So the way I address this, I say, okay, Let's imagine Paul does write this. He is aware that he's suffering so deeply and being persecuted that his life is about to be taken from him. So these are his last words. Or if Paul didn't write it and it's pseudepigraphal, whoever wrote it was so firmly aware of the death of Paul that they felt the need to put this on his lips. Either way, it's kind of an indirect support of his death. Again, not as strong as other sources, but it helps make a cumulative case. The solid one would be back to 1 Clement chapter 5, again written in the 90s, where he references Peter and Paul as modern day examples when it was written of those who ran the race to the end in the footsteps of Jesus. Get into the second century, and again, you have Ignatius, you have Irenaeus, you have Polycarp, at least five to six references within that living memory and a bunch after the end of the second century, unanimously confirming, as far as I could find, that Paul, in fact, died as a martyr, which makes sense when you look at the life of Paul, 2 Corinthians 11, how much he suffered, mm -hmm. that he, in fact, would die that way. So I think Paul is, I think we're on very solid historical ground with those four. Now, I'll tell you one more interesting thing, at least to me, is when I wrote my dissertation, the academic book, it came out 2015. When Paul is beheaded in the book of, in the, in the, um, the Acts of Paul, this milk type substance comes out. I interpreted that as being metaphorical, like his death offers nourishment to help people spiritually or something like that. Well, I had a, a doctor, a heart surgeon email me and I've been trying to find the link. And he said, there's actually a condition where somebody secretes when they're under a lot of stress, a kind of milk substance from the neck. Mm 
Now, that doesn't mean that's what happened to Paul, but it made me step back and go, okay, that's at least interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Maybe I'm writing off some of these things as all being metaphorical and made up. There may be a little bit more historical core, but that's the dance you have to go through in assessing some of these sources as carefully as you can. So, uh, yeah, I would say it definitely helps that we have uh, we have a lot of writings from the Apostle Paul and that he's writing to people who he obviously couldn't be making up a bunch of details about his uh, about his story and his, his past. Um, there would be too many people to uh, to call him out. Um, so, yeah, I th- I'd say we're on really, really good grounds there. So those uh, those what do you call those? The big four? Yeah, we yeah we could call them the big four. Those I would say are just in the higher realm of historical probability that we have good confidence uh, were killed in a way tied to their faith. And uh, it, it's pretty cool. Um, that it's pretty cool that you have a kind of uh, you have a, a kind of diversity there, right? You have uh, you know a couple guys who are part of Jesus inner circle. You have uh, someone who is related to Jesus but didn't believe in him during his lifetime, and then you have. A, a persecutor, a persecutor uh, who tried to de- destroy the church, and these are the guys that we have. This collection of people is the is the group that we have the best evidence for in terms of them being completely willing to go to their horrible, horrible, bloody deaths for Jesus. And so, uh, pretty, uh, pretty interesting group there. Uh, what do you think of what do you think of uh, people outside those those big four? Well, when we come back to the 12, there, there also are traditions of Mark, there's traditions of Luke, of Stephen. I didn't go down those rabbit trails because I think the evidence is less as strong of their having a firsthand appearance of the risen Jesus, and those documents are just later. So I had to limit the search to some degree. So if we jump back into the 12, John is a really interesting story. I entered this assuming that John died a natural death. That's a story. Well, I came, I came across scholars like Ben Witherington, and Richard Bauckham, and others who actually think John died as a martyr, and they make a better case for it than I was even aware of in the literature. Now I'm not ultimately persuaded by it. I just had somebody email me like two weeks ago an article of a new academic book, haven't had a chance to read it yet, and he goes, "Hey, here's my case for the death of John." So I want to believe that because it makes my case stronger but I've just got to follow where the evidence leads. And here's some of the things that they'll point to for John. Uh, Textually, people will say, if you read the beginning of Acts, John is traveling with Peter. He's all over the place. But then he just disappears off the scene and doesn't show up in the Jerusalem council in Acts 15. Why? Hmm. Because he was martyred with his brother James three chapters earlier in Acts chapter 12. Now, it doesn't say that, but that's one argument people will make, which is somewhat of an argument from silence, but nevertheless, it's interesting he disappears and doesn't show up at the council. Uh, The other argument is when Jesus is traveling on the road and James and John say, we want to reign with you. And what does Jesus say? He says, you have to be baptized with the baptism that I'll be baptized. In other words, you gotta drink the cup. Now, what's interesting, David, is I've asked a few New Testament scholars, what does he mean by this, where they're not thinking about the martyrdom of John? And a few have said, oh, yeah, he's saying they'll be martyred. And I'll say, well, wait a minute, what about the tradition of John? And a few have said, oh, okay, wait a minute. I wasn't thinking about that. Now, I don't think the only interpretation of drinking the cup is that you would be martyred. Mm -hmm. But I do think that is a very interesting argument that can be made because, again, Acts 12, that happens to James. He drank the cup that Jesus drank. Well, what about John? Jesus gave a prophecy of this. So I actually think – I can't prove this, but I think maybe some of the traditions that start showing up in the 3rd and 4th century about John. For example, Tertullian tells one you've heard about John being thrown in boiling oil Mm -hmm. but surviving. Well, that's a way of putting him through the act of martyrdom, but not dying, which would show that Jesus wasn't a false prophet in Mark chapter 10. Mm -hmm. And there's other ones of him taking poison and surviving that I didn't find for the other apostles. Now, I can't prove that, but I'm suspicious that might be the case. 
But I do think that that prophecy of Jesus can mean, are you willing to suffer for me? Are you willing to take the lot that I've given to you and not necessarily martyrdom? But that's a textual evidence that is used for the death of John. Now, the other evidence is for John is when you get into really more the turn of the third, the fourth and fifth centuries, there's these calendars where, where early different churches would celebrate um, certain deaths of martyrs. And James and John are put together at that time as both dying as martyrs in some of these calendars in the fourth, fifth, and sixth centuries. Hmm. Now, what's interesting is there's that tradition, but now we're dealing with the fourth century you know, instead of the first and second century. So it just has less weight. The one piece of evidence that's fascinating is there's a reference in, I've got to think about this for a second. Philip of Side, who wrote after Eusebius, references a writing from Papias in the early second century. And he quotes Papias as indicating the martyrdom and death of John. Now, Philip of Sidae writes, if I remember correctly, the 5th or 6th century. He's quoting Papias early 2nd century. Eusebius also quotes Papias, but doesn't quote that passage. So I haven't analyzed that passage in depth, but the scholars that I've talked to have say they don't trust Philip of Sidae there and think that he probably got that mistaken about Papias. All that is to say... I wasn't aware of any of this about the death of John, and it was enough to at least make me pause and go, huh, that's interesting. It's at least possible, even though I'm not convinced it's as strong as some of the other ones. So the uh, the uh, the interesting thing here is that, so you have situations where you have good evidence that, the, that certain people died uh, as martyrs, and then you have late stories that, that can't necessarily be trusted, third or fourth century sources that you, you, you can't necessarily trust. And so you can't put too much stock in them and say, yes, this is how this person died back in the first century. But that kind of goes in the other direction as well, that if you have a third or fourth century about the Apostle John, and it's saying he, he he wasn't killed. Well, he may have actually been killed. And so you could actually put together yeah. a case. And so it's uh, it's just the idea is in the third and fourth century, we know that people were embellishing stuff, so you can't trust them completely. And therefore, kind of have to sometimes start from from the ground up unless you know where they're getting their information from. But uh, so, so with someone like the yeah. Apostle John, if you can't trust the later story, then if you do come up with some good reasons for thinking that he died, then you could actually... Uh, you could actually uh, alter the alter what 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 is commonly believed because that's the, that's the normal belief the disciples all died except that's died right. for their faith except John so yeah interesting stuff all right we're gonna wrap up in a in a in a couple minutes here um, any any other anything anything else you want to cover and along those lines um, we we can go a little bit further into this mm -hmm. if if it's helpful I can't wait too long for dinner I'm on the west coast but let's go a little bit longer if you uh -huh. want to if that's there's fine, questions that's fine. here. Mm -hmm. But let me jump into, so let me frame this again for everybody. Study the 12 disciples, James and Paul. I think James, brother of Jesus and Paul, good grounds they died as martyrs. Of the 12, James, brother of son of Zebedee, brother of John and Peter, good reason died as a martyr. What about when we move to the rest of the apostles? Well, there's two that I think are at least more probable than not. So in other words, they're not 50-50, maybe they're 51-49, mm -hmm. but at least you could make the case that we have interesting early evidence that moves it in the direction of probability. So Thomas, for example, mm -hmm. we have the early source of the death of Thomas is in a book called The Acts of Thomas, which is basically the end of the second century, early third century. So this is not a document that's nearly as early for all the other four that we talked about. The Acts of Thomas, and it's legend-filled, but it seems to maintain a historical core of uh, Thomas being sent to northern India, moving down south, dying as a martyr killed by spears. Well, you also have this tradition in India itself, this non-written tradition that's been passed down historically – 
So when I studied Thomas, there's a lot of Western scholars that completely dismiss the traditions because they don't do history the way it's done in the West. And yet in the East, especially in India, they have songs, they have poems, they have stories, they have these traditions and even burial spots that trace back very, very early that seem to be independent of the Acts of Thomas. Now, scholars differ over this. Some say you have the Acts of Thomas and these traditions. They're really only one tradition. If so, I don't think we could have a ton of confidence in the death of Thomas. But as I look at them and assess them, there seem to be enough differences that I'm at least inclined, although I could be mistaken about this, to think that there's two different strains about Thomas that both agree that, number one, he went to India, number two, that he died as a martyr. Now, they're later, and they're not as qualitatively historically solid as the others, but I'm not willing to dismiss it, especially because with Thomas, I couldn't find any other traditions of him. You look at Andrew, mm -hmm. there are dozens and dozens, Bartholomew, dozens and dozens of traditions. These guys go everywhere. But when it comes to Thomas, all I could find that is early is consistently he went to India, and all but a few traditions he died as a martyr. And we actually know from a first century document that you could easily travel from the area of Rome or Jerusalem to India at that time. It actually was a unique window where we have these documents where people talk about even the currents you could ride on, where you could find certain spices and ports. There's no reason to think he couldn't have gone there. And then in the second century, we have some other written records of Christianity uniquely being in India. So it's not as strong as the other traditions, but it was enough for me to kind of pause and go, you know, this may be more probable than not. I'd argue the same with Andrew. You have at least two lines of evidence with Andrew, one, the Acts of Andrew, middle second century, and then another source that describes in the Acts of Andrew, he's crucified. And this other source, Hippolytus, he's hung on a tree. So they both mean the same things, but very different descriptions. Tells me there could be two sources for Andrew. So maybe it's more probable than not. The rest of the apostles, David, I don't know where history ends and legend begins. I mean, poor Bartholomew, I found traditions he was skinned alive, burned, beheaded, stabbed to death, drowned, crucified. I mean, the poor guy either had a really bad day or people are just making stuff up about Bartholomew. 90, so 99, 99, way, 99 ways to die. I mean, right. Exactly. And that's so I guess in some two of the 12, we have very good evidence. Two of them are maybe more probable than not. The rest of them, I think that's eight, if I did my math correctly. I don't know where history ends and legend begins. The historical record is just not there to make a sober assessment of it. Mm -hmm. So we've got, um, we've got uh, of the 12, we've got uh, two, and then another two more probable than not, and then a couple who are not of the 12. And looks like, uh, so... The, the idea here would be if people are only willing to die for what they believe, looks like you've got plenty of people, plenty of people still from very diverse backgrounds. Again, some of them Jesus' original followers, uh, then James, who apparently yeah. rejected him, Paul, who was a persecutor. And so looks like you have uh, plenty of evidence there to conclude that either Jesus just happened to attract people who would make something up and then be willing to die for it, or the same reasoning still applies. You, you, you have a bunch of people who are willing to die for what they believe in. What is the best explanation for that? And so, um, it, you know, those, those of you non-Christians who are looking at this, um, you know, what, what do you think? What, what do you think? What, what, what evidence do you have that would account for Peter and James being willing to lay down their lives for, you know, their beliefs about Jesus. And then James, the brother of Jesus, who that's a different James, didn't believe in him mm -hmm. during his earthly ministry, but was still ready to die for him later. And then Paul is a persecutor who's disgusted by Christianity, who converts to Christianity and says it was because he encountered the risen Jesus. 
what do you have that would even account for this level? So everyone else, you know, everyone else aside, what do you guys have that would account for all of this that would actually fit? Because as soon as you start going hallucinations, pretty strange to say that all these different people in these different situations are all going to be hallucinating the same guy. Or So anyway, the, the idea, guys, is if you have an explanation for something, if you have a belief about Jesus, it should fit the evidence. And if you don't have a theory that actually fits the evidence, then, you know, you got a, you got a problem there. And, and if, if I could add one more thing that might help, and one of the questions is, or one of the points that I make is, although we don't have a record of the apostles being given the opportunity to recant before death, we also don't have a record in history of any of the apostles recanting whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Now, you might say, well, that's an argument from silence. But to me, it's an argument of silence with some teeth. Why? Because think about it, non-Christians like Celsus, who starts writing into the second century, if there was one of the 12 or even a tradition of one of the 12 who gave up on their faith and didn't actually die for it, you better believe a skeptic would have brought this out. On the flip side, so would have Christians, because there were debates about what would happen with Christians who at the point of death chose to live instead of die for their faith. Could they be allowed back in the fold? If there was any tradition in the church of like, well, what about Matthias? He actually gave up. You better believe Christians would have brought it out. So the fact that we don't have any record of any of them recanting tells me we're on solid ground to think that they didn't. Now, with that said, there are some traditions when you get into the second, third, fourth century of some of the apostles dying natural deaths. Now, with Philip, we have one natural death, one that he's crucified. I'm not really sure what happened to Philip. So there are some records of natural deaths which may have happened, but there's not any record of any of them recanting their faith whatsoever from Christians or skeptics I could find anywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been would have been too difficult to deal with something like that if it had happened. It wouldn't have needed to be a secret. In other words, if someone had recanted, you just say, look, and this guy lost his faith and, you know, shame on him or something like that. So it wouldn't have been, you know, the, not something that everyone would have needed to hide or something like that. And yeah, so yeah, but you got none of that. So interesting. Uh, here's a question that that I get when I talk along those lines, and I'm sure you get as well. Black Tuesday Film says, I think skeptics will say Joseph Smith was willing to face persecution for his belief. Can you ask Dr. McDowell to emphasize how the apostles gained nothing for this makeup, uh, for making this up? So, um, yeah. So what are, you, what are your thoughts yep. on the Joseph Smith comparison here? If you Google Sean McDowell, Joseph Smith martyr, you'll find essentially a chapter that was going to go in my book that I didn't put in there and I kind of summed it up into a blog. So as best I can remember, a couple things to keep in mind. Number one, uh, Joseph Smith, it's not clear. He was arrested and put in the Carthage jail, I believe the name of it was, because of raiding a newspaper that was going to report negative things about him. It's not clear yet, it never went to court, whether Joseph Smith was innocent or guilty. I think there's good historical reason, in fact, to think that he really was guilty. Second, when he goes to prison, he brings a gun with him and gets in a gunfight to defend himself. Now, I don't have a problem with somebody using a gun to defend themselves, but that does raise the question, is this the same way the apostles actually went out and were willing to suffer and die. And I think there's a very diametric opposition there. Third thing that I would say is my friend Jay Warner Wallace has brought this out. He has said in every, he, so those who may not know him, former atheist at 35, uh, goes to church, hears the gospel, examines the gospel of Mark through the lens of forensic science, has never lost a case, cold case uh, ever. And he said in every case he's ever had, people lie for one of three reasons or commit crimes for one of three reasons, sex and lust, power, or money, power, sex, and money. Look at the apostles. It wasn't about power. Jesus distinctly said, if you want to be first, you got to be last. He washed their feet. He said, lay down your life. It wasn't about sex. I mean, Jesus had many opportunities to take advantage of women 
and number one, he was single. Number two, he only showed the highest dignity and care and respect for women. It wasn't about power and sex, and it certainly wasn't about money. You see Jesus preaching caring for the poor, and read the book of Acts, and they talk about caring for the poor. And yet you look at the life of Joseph Smith. Was it about power? Well, he did want to run for U.S. president. He tried to do that. He also tried to have his own military. Uh, number two, was it about money? He had his own bank that he tried to run and he controlled. Was it about sex? Well, he had, I don't know the numbers, somewhere between 25 and some say up to four dozen different wives in very suspicious ways. So that doesn't mean Joseph Smith was lying. That's not my point. Look in the Old Testament. There's plenty of flawed characters that God uses. But if we're going to compare the apostles and Jesus to them, the very three things that you look for in motivation are lacking with Jesus, lacking in the apostles, and they're all present with Joseph Smith. So I don't think he qualifies as a martyr, even though you hear this tradition throughout Mormon history. Mm -hmm. And um, just to share my thoughts on on this issue, um, the uh, I have no problem with someone being sincere and being totally wrong. So we have good reason to be suspicious of Joseph Smith and his claims to have received revelations, right? Because he got a lot of stuff out of his revelations. But even if we had none of that, even if he, you know, even if uh, he didn't get any women out of it, and even if he didn't have any, you know, political aspirations, anything like that, and he just went out with this message, um, we know that individuals can be delusional, right? We know there are cult leaders who actually believe what they're saying. Like, I believe Muhammad sincerely believed what he was preaching. Not necessarily in every instance, but I believe Muhammad was sincere. Uh, and I've been in multiple mental hospitals, so I've, <laughs> I've known people who were out of their minds. So that's not what we're talking about, right? If one individual, if one individual said uh, he saw someone rise from the dead, I would not put a lot of stock in it unless I had some very good reason to trust that person. If multiple people from multiple backgrounds who had nothing, who had nothing really to gain, all started saying it, that's a kind of that's a kind of different category. So, um, yeah, my, my view of Joseph Smith is even if everything about him told us that he was completely sincere and had no reason to invent anything. I could still think that he's that he's just delusional, or he's got he's got some some mental problems. Uh, you'd have to have some other people verifying it, which I think you did at one time with Joseph Smith, and then they ended up recanting and things like that, and so he ended up with uh, ended up with some problems. Um, all right, well uh, let's uh, let's take a couple super chats real quick. Uh, There's just a couple of extra comments, and then we will uh, we will wrap it up because Sean is East Coast. I mean, West Coast. You're West Coast. West you're Coast, out, in the middle, out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and if you stay there long enough, you're going to fall into the ocean. Um, a fresh coat of paint said, um, here's one. A fresh coat of paint said, even if none of the apostles were proven to be martyrs, wouldn't we still have a case for their sincerity based on the heavy persecution they faced, such as being beaten and jailed several times? So uh, a fresh coat of paint. The, the idea here is historians... Historians who are, you know, coming at the sources, they're looking at these books as sources, right? Like as historical sources and stuff, and they look at what they can gather. Whereas, you know, as 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 a Christian, I believe, you know, I believe everything I read in, in the Book of Acts and in the Gospels and so on. Um, historians are looking a little more critical. So, uh, in a little more critical fashion, they're saying, "Hey, what do we have good evidence for?" But, uh, uh, Sean, what what do you think? Do you have, you know, not just not simply from a Christian perspective, but from a historical perspective? Do we have good evidence that the apostles were uh, uh, endured a great deal of persecution and that we could trust them on that basis even if they hadn't died? I do, and I think this is a perceptive question that I don't have to show any of them died as martyrs actually to establish their sincerity. And the best way to do this is to look in the book of Acts. You actually have a list of the name of all the apostles. I think it's in Acts chapter 1. And then, of course, in Acts chapter 2, you have Pentecost. They start preaching it. By Acts chapter 4, they're being persecuted. And they're told, you know, stop preaching this. They're beaten. They're thrown in prison. And it's starting to cost them something. And it mm -hmm. says Peter speaks on behalf of the apostles. We can't. We believe Jesus rose from the grave. And so we fear God more than we fear men. That's enough to show if the book of Acts is reliable, and I think it is. And there's also some 
additional extra biblical writings that come the generation after that talk about them preaching and going out, etc. But I think that's enough to establish their sincerity. But then when we nail down and go, oh, we also have some of them that died, to me that just adds a strength to the case overall. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. So, yes, your point is, your point, I believe, is... Your point I, is uh, just looking for the name. Yeah, you know, yeah. Fresh coat of paint posted that. Uh, so yes, you're. We agree with your point. A fresh coat of paint. And so yeah, it's just uh, we would have had the evidence anyway, but we got the extra evidence. A um, couple more comments. Uh, Salgrad said the disciples of Muhammad wanted to leave Islam after he died. Well, you certainly had lots of the early Muslims in in certain situations who were kind of compelled to convert, and they wanted to leave after. Uh, he after Muhammad died, and then they had what were called the the apostate wars, where they were forced to to come mm. back come back to the fold. Uh, Peter Millich said, "I remember these words from you, David. Liars make poor martyrs. I didn't invent that saying. That that was I had concluded that when I was uh, you know on my path to Christianity. I concluded that I concluded that that uh, that I, I couldn't think of any reason these guys would go out and die for something that they made up. Um, but yeah, I, I've heard that from other people. I heard that little." Cool, cool line. Liars make poor martyrs. Um, all right, so Sean, I know you've got to uh, get going. Uh, again, anyone, everyone who's watching, there are links to uh, Sean's website and his book on this topic and his YouTube channel. And uh, you post all kinds of videos. You post regular videos. You post. You do live streams as well on your on your channel. Yeah, I try to do two to three a week. I've been doing interviews. I'm interviewing J.P. Moreland on the Soul tomorrow. And then it might might interest anybody watching Friday night or Sunday night for Father's Day. I'm going to interview my dad, who is 80, and he's been in ministry 50, 55 years. And I've asked him if he'd be willing to share certain untold stories and wisdom that he's learned along the way that he's never shared publicly. Mm-hmm. So if I didn't know my dad and the people involved, I'm not kidding, David, I would have a hard time believing this. But my dad has lived a modern day Paul life. So if your audience likes watching YouTube channels and you're not streaming Sunday night, come on and, and check it out. And I think he's going to share some stories that are pretty interesting and powerful. Just a lot of life lessons that he's been through. And then next Wednesday, I got uh, Preston Sprinkle coming on, and we're talking about one of the common revisionist arguments. Uh, today is that the word homosexual was invented and not originally in the Bible itself. And it's a modern day invention to kind of persecute against gay people. And we're just going to unpack that theologically this is mistaken. And it goes back to Leviticus 18, goes back to Romans 1, goes back to 1 Corinthians 6 itself. So those are the kind, just had a debate on evolution with a prominent Christian who believes in evolution and Doug Axe, intelligent design proponent, uh, Bill Craig's going to come on and talk about his book on atonement. So lots of cool interviews. And then I just post, you know, one or two videos a week. If people are done watching yours and want some more substance, check it out. <laughs> yeah, guys, if you uh, if you get sick of mine, then uh, definitely go over to uh, Sean's <laughs> channel. Uh, but yeah, guys, uh, subscribe to his channel if you're interested in any of that stuff. You definitely you definitely want to uh, definitely want to hear um the accumulated wisdom of Josh McDowell over the years, mm. so over the decades. Um, yeah, probably the. I can't think of anyone. Uh, I can't think of anyone who sort of spurred uh, apologetics uh, in the in the modern area more than Josh McDowell. So you'll want to well, check you, that. You out. know, David. What, what's interesting? Sorry to cut you off. Is part of what spurred this to me is we've lost Norm Geisler in the past couple yeah. of years. Ravi just passed away. Mm. I mean, who of that age is still with us that we can soak this wisdom from? And I just thought, gosh, I got to ask him certain questions. And I got to imagine there's a lot of people who just want to hear this perspective. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was with my resurrection class today. I teach at Biola. And I asked him, like, how has the resurrection argument changed? And he goes, he says to my class, he goes, nobody was doing this when I started in yeah. the 50s. <laughs> with C.S. Lewis, Francis Schaeffer, and one other guy, he couldn't remember his name. Yeah. I mean, just how much this has changed is pretty cool. So yep. anyways, I just want to gather that wisdom. Hopefully God hasn't with us for a long time, but wow, we can. That that makes sense. My, uh, my great-great-grandmother died in uh, 
2003, and she was 105 years old. And I just remember thinking after she died, wait a minute, she was born in 1898. So she lived oh She lived through World War I, the Great Depression, World War II. She knew people who were in the Civil War. She had family members who were in the Civil War. How did I not sit her down with a camera in front of her and say, start at the beginning and tell me everything you remember for posterity's sake? Didn't do it. And so, yes, we got to, uh, you got to get all of this out there. You, you might want to see if you're... Hope your dad actually likes doing the live stream and you can you can keep doing them and uh taking people's questions mm. and and things like that so that is awesome everyone sub everyone subscribe to uh sean's channel um get his book if you're interested in i mean this is fundamental this is fundamental very important stuff uh in the area of apologetics the resurrection that is that is the heart of christian belief and so we need to know why we believe this stuff so uh thanks to sean for coming on here as far as i know the next time i'll be live streaming will be friday with Jay Smith, Rory Husky. I saw you ask if uh, if uh, you could have a conversation sometime. If you want, you can actually. If if there are apologetics issues you're concerned about, you can actually uh, maybe come on live at some point. And maybe uh, maybe Sam and I will set up something where you know we have four or five people, you know, one after another for come on for. 10 or 15, 20, 30 minutes or something like that so we can uh, go through people's questions. But uh, yeah, go ahead and contact me. We'll see something about that. All right. Thank you, Sean, for joining us and sharing uh, what you learned in your research and uh, hope some people come over and watch you. Thanks, my friend. All right. Go get some food. <laughs>